all aboard the toxic toxic train. <laughs> what is it? She's turned her accusations and her response into a Disney musical number here, I suppose. Being next to someone who is in their house, been around their family, you have some issues. So my uncle is one of my best friends, and also he likes to cuddle attacks, so. Sometimes I would literally just go to Google and type in like, Trisha Paytas nude. At best, this is disingenuous, and at worst, this is an active attempt to invalidate the people who have come forward to like bravely share their stories. The girl who I was sent of was kind of on a watch list. Oh yeah, it's fun. We thought we had seen the worst apologies on YouTube, or rather, non-apologies. I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. When I say I hate that person, I feel bad. My lipsticks are not moldy. They're not unsafe for you in any way. It feels like every day somebody new is canceled. But we never expected someone to turn their non-apology into a musical performance. That is, until Colleen Ballinger apologized. My team has strongly advised me to not say what I want to say. I never said that I couldn't sing what I want to say. But I was just trying to be besties with everybody. She's gaslighting, manipulating. Oh, she's a narcissist and a rat. The only thing I've ever groomed is my two Persian cats. Colleen Ballinger tried to make the very serious accusations levied against her into something of a performance, a show, and instead a circus ensued. She's been accused of having inappropriate relationships with some of her underage fans. You've committed a crime. Claims that Colleen sent inappropriate messages to young kids. And Colleen was the one who was seen as the clown, the joker. Colleen's non-apology was not taken seriously. She was in even bigger and bigger trouble as more allegations and reactions ensued. I never said that I couldn't sing what I want to say. I think there was something more sinister under there in a whole way. That's probably the worst I've seen from someone that I've like considered a friend. Colleen Ballinger is the worst kind of monster. That's creepy and should probably be illegal. What the f- The one who's been hiding under our bed all along, yet we never noticed. And unfortunately, we found out recently, it seems that Johnny Silvestri, someone who propped themselves up as a victim, may have been another monster in disguise, a sinister one that hid behind the shadows of the victims. Pauline is the clown in the gutters, who looked innocent and friendly to children passing by, till it was too late. Colleen Ballinger's ukulele video wasn't an apology. It was a performance she intended to victimize herself and deflect blame onto all of her victims and all of her detractors. And now she's left countless of people scarred, damaged, and traumatized and refuses to own up to her actions. I know you wanted me to say that I was 100% in the wrong. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna take that route. But the reality is people saw right through Colleen's clownish act knew that the victims had a real story to tell. I remember I was just really scared. How like creepy Colleen sending Lana Ray was. That they were using their platforms to speak out so that Colleen could not harm any more minors the way that she had harmed them. So Colleen's clown act put her career in a casket. Her performance, her non-apology caused a major chain reaction on the internet. Stir hiding under the bed had come out to face the light. The clown had run its final circus act. So let's do a deep dive into everything that's happened since Colleen Ballinger's non-apology. 
in a new deep dive series that I'm trying out on the channel that I'd like to call Into the Vortex. Not only because my team here loves space, sci-fi, and cyberpunk themes, but also because Vortex has a double meaning. One of its meanings can also be a dangerous or bad situation in which you become more and more involved and from which you cannot escape, which I think encapsulates a deep dive pretty well. So let's dive into the vortex on Colleen Ballinger. Warning. Vortex approaching. Evacuate through escape plus immediately. Hello friends and internet acquaintances, welcome or welcome back to another video on my channel. And today's video is part two on the Colleen Ballinger saga, covering everything that has happened since the Colleen Ballinger apology video. Now, before we get into this video, if you watched my last video on Illuminati, I want to thank you so much for all the overwhelming support on my last video. And I was just blown away by the awesome community that we have. Before we get into the video, I have something else incredible to share that has completely transformed my daily routine, which is today's sponsor, AG1. AG1 is a game changer that makes it easy to make sure I'm getting the nutrition I need every day. Not only my essential vitamins, but also the important things like prebiotics, probiotics, and micronutrients and phytonutrients that we often forget about in our daily routines and diets. As a busy working mom, my diet lately has been significantly lacking. I've needed a lot of extra and supplemental help to get my nutrition to the level that it needs to be. Luckily, AG1 is empowering people to take ownership of their health. AG1 is the ultimate foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body, brain, and gut health. I've been incorporating AG1 into my morning routine right when I wake up because once I get going throughout my day, I often get so distracted with my busy schedule that I forget to make sure I'm getting in a nutritional meal. So waking up and taking AG1 has been a great way to get that nutrition in right off the bat, which really fuels me before my day even starts and keeps me going throughout the day. The flagship product AG1 is designed as an effortless daily habit and the nutritional cornerstone of everyone's health journey. Plus, AG1 has great gut health benefits with prebiotics, probiotics, and plant-based enzymes. AG1 also has 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including rhodiola, magnesium, and B vitamins to support sustained energy which I have definitely been needing lately. As someone who just hasn't been having enough time to have perfectly balanced nutritional meals lately, incorporating AG1 into my morning rituals has given me peace of mind that I can still have a healthier lifestyle even if I don't have the time that I used to have to be creating healthy meals. So if you'd like to try out AG1, they have an exclusive offer just for you. When you head to my special link, drinkag one dot com slash cool world happy mind will receive a free one year supply of ag vitamin d3 and k2 and five ag1 travel packs with your first purchase that's drink ag1.com slash cool world happy mind or click my link in the description and get started today In June, I posted a video titled How Colleen Ballinger Destroyed Her Career, detailing everything leading up to Colleen Ballinger's apology. Much of that initial video went over allegations that had led to Colleen Ballinger's apology being released. The former fans who had bravely come out publicly to share their stories of their inappropriate interactions with Colleen Ballinger when they were minors and how Colleen had treated them horribly in the aftermath. I was about 16. I saw Colleen's eyes widen because she realized I was not wearing pants. For some reason, that didn't stop her from continuing. She would always compliment parts of my body that were very skinny. 
and this is something that has lasted with me for my entire life. She spreads them so far that you can see the spandex I was wearing under my romper, which thank God I was wearing. And then became an everyday thing, so. How old were you yeah. at the time? Uh, 13 when it first started. But since Colleen Ballinger's apology, much has happened. That well has left Colleen Ballinger's career in a casket which is what we're covering in today's video. And well, the circus surrounding everything that has transpired, circulating the Colleen Ballinger controversy. But if you're feeling out of the loop or haven't watched my first video on Colleen Ballinger or need a refresher, I thought I'd summarize in a synopsis the allegations of the Colleen Ballinger controversy. In 2020, content creator Adam McIntyre released a video detailing the very inappropriate relationship Colleen Ballinger had with him over many years, starting when he was a minor and only 13 years old. Over the course of this relationship, Colleen Ballinger had sent him lingerie. This is what I was sent, okay. After Adam had released this video about Colleen, Colleen Ballinger had made a response video addressing these allegations. He asked for the underwear. And so in my mind at the time, this was no different than all the other weird stuff I send to my fans as a joke. Which initially sent a wave of bullying and harassment Adam's way from Colleen Ballinger fans. But then in 2023, all of these allegations resurfaced again. When a YouTuber by the name of Cody Rance left the Colleen Ballinger fan base and made a video about it, detailing how Colleen Ballinger was leaving inappropriate messages in a group chat that had minors. This group chat was called the Weenies group chat, and after this video would become infamous. Colleen Ballinger would allegedly leave messages in this group chat asking minors inappropriate questions like, are they a virgin? and asking what their favorite sex position is. After years of being bullied and harassed by Colleen Ballinger's fans for making claims that Colleen Ballinger was being inappropriate towards him, Adam finally felt like he was vindicated because there were finally more stories to back up his claims of Colleen being creepy behind the scenes. It's no longer the only one shouting into the void. So Adam McIntyre released a series of videos, two of the most notable being I was right about Colleen and my relationship with Colleen Ballinger. People were listening to Adam McIntyre's harrowing story of what seemed to be manipulation grooming of a minor among a litany of other inappropriate behaviors displayed by Colleen. Adam's videos, as well as the leaked text messages, absolutely shocked people and prompted others to come forward with their uncomfortable and inappropriate interactions with Colleen. Becky, who was 16 at the time, was invited on stage by Colleen during one of her Miranda Sings live show segments where Colleen Ballinger ended up exposing Becky to a sea of people, scarring her and traumatizing her. I basically felt naked, so it felt incredibly sexually violating. I was younger and my body was still developing and I was still becoming comfortable with myself, so for her to use my body as entertainment on stage really set, um, my confidence back quite a lot. Oliver was 13 when Colleen Ballinger's brother, Trent Ballinger, sent inappropriate DMs and messages. Throughout this story, someone named Johnny Silvestri has been highlighted as a victim. At the time of this controversy, Johnny released a series of videos talking about his experiences working on the Miranda Sings tour. Johnny claimed he was bullied and endured poor treatment while working on tour. Yes, I was a child, I was a teenager, Major. I was bullied, <laughs> tormented on a daily. But Johnny's story didn't stop there. In another video, Johnny's focus completely shifted over to Joshua David Evans, Colleen Ballinger's ex-husband. Johnny claimed Joshua had an inappropriate relationship with him. I'm not going to show the whole thing, but that looks like a phone number to me. Why did you give a 16-year-old your phone number? 
but much of the proof he showed for this was an old paper crown with a phone number written on it, which he alleged Joshua gave him when he was a minor, alongside photos of him with Josh when he was younger. Johnny also claimed he ran a social media account for Josh for free, but I never received any payment for it. As I mentioned in my previous video, which mirrored a lot of Adam's experiences with Colleen Ballinger. Whenever anyone tried to press for hard evidence that Joshua David Evans groomed Johnny and was, as Johnny continually claimed, worse than Colleen Ballinger, there was always a convenient excuse as to why Johnny couldn't show evidence. My old MacBook Pro revived itself. But many people initially believed Johnny out of their good nature and wanting to believe victims. And now many believe that Johnny abused people's good nature and accused an innocent man. What didn't help with this matter is Joshua David Evans had made statements apologizing for inappropriately interacting with underage fans, which led many to assume, inaccurately it now seems, that Johnny was telling the truth. Apologizing to you is the least I could do to begin for everything. I'm sorry. And I left him on red. On August 17th, Swoop, an in-depth documentary-style channel here on YouTube, released a nearly four-hour video detailing all the inaccuracies of Johnny's story and how he may just be the devil hiding in Colleen's shadow, who attached himself to the victims of Colleen Ballinger for, well, who knows what reason. In this documentary, Swoop and her incredibly in-depth team found that not only was Johnny greatly exaggerating the extent of his relationship with Joshua, but also participated in the mean bully behavior that Colleen utilized to victimize and harm her child fans. My opinion of Johnny and the fandom was always that Johnny was the mean girl. Then, as an adult, Johnny was participating in group chats and conversations with minors. Oh no, Johnny was in DMs with minors? I was. Johnny was a part of the entire toxic system taking place within Colleen Ballinger's circle. Even as he left the circle and was on his own, he continued to participate in group chats with minors. You know, there were also chat rooms or DMs that I was uh, added to during tour. And it was tricky because I didn't want to be in DMs with a bunch of teenage girls. Like, I was, you know, confident in my sexuality. If anything, I want boys, well, men, to be in my DMs. So the story of Johnny is a dark, sad, and twisted one, especially how he tried to destroy the one adult in this situation who was trying to actually properly speak out, apologize, and take accountability, which I'll expand upon later in this video. Another major player in this toxic gossip circus ring who is often forgot about because of the silence that he has had throughout this entire matter, but who participated in the abuse and should not be forgotten about is Corey DeSoto. Corey DeSoto is Colleen Ballinger's best friend and right-hand man. Hi guys, it's me Colleen with my best friend in the whole world, Corey DeSoto. He participated in a lot of the inappropriate actions and content Colleen has made in the past. Just grabbed the dog and pinched its skin and dug my nails into it. The dog yelps, turns around to protect itself and bites me in the face. And then they had to put the dog to sleep because the dog was dead dangerous to be around, so I murdered a dog. Was involved in the group chats with minors, messaging minors frequently with inappropriate messages. Corey sends into the script chat of people of very young ages and says, I swear to the Lord, if I find out you leak this info to your friends, I'll block you all forever. Even at one point, sending an infamous audio message that Adam had shared, saying that these minors are close friends to him. <laughs> It's Corey. I just wanted to record a voice memo because I have like a lot to say. Um, but first of all, I just want to say that like I love all of you. Like you uh, honestly mean so much to me. Oh my god! Um, oh my you have god. no idea. I know that it sounds weird because I'm a full grown adult and some of you are younger. He fat shamed a fan at a meet and greet and according to many victims, was involved in much of the bullying that took place behind the scenes. So Corey is just lying on me yet again. 
but he and Colleen also made a lot of creepy content together and were publicly acting inappropriate for years in front of our very eyes, which I'll talk about a little more later in this video. All of this created a toxic system that primed fans to fall right into their trap of allowing their inappropriate behavior into their lives, along with all the bullying and abuse aka a grooming system, normalizing terrible treatment and behavior around minors, and Corey DeSoto seemed to be a major player in it all. People were saying, collectively, this is messed up. And collectively, we're saying, Colleen, you need to say something about this because this is messed up. Well, what we never expected was exactly what happened. There was the the crash, but hey, The non-apology. The career casket. The circus performance the toxic gossip train. Colleen Ballinger's apology has officially been rated the absolute worst apology of all time. Absolutely everyone has reacted to it and well, it's become a shit show. More and more allegations have surfaced. More and more things have come out about Colleen. The more you find out about Colleen and the deeper you look, the more and more you uncover. And well, We've uncovered a lot here, so get ready. The vortex is never ending, and it gets darker and darker the further and further you go. Get ready for the circus. She decides to put on the entire clown outfit, grab her trusty ukulele, and go to battle. As a defense lawyer, certainly not a good idea. That's the sort of thing that gets you hammered on sentence. As soon as she grabbed the ukulele, I knew this whole thing would be a joke. Colleen Ballinger's non-apology video last 3.7 million views within the span of 24 hours. It's now her most viewed video on her vlog channel, and even more viewed than her pregnancy announcement video. Adam McIntyre made a tweet stating, As much as Colleen discredited and made fun of me, which I'm sure was extremely traumatic for Adam McIntyre, at a certain point you want the person who victimized you to at least acknowledge they hurt you, and instead they attack you, make fun of you, for millions to see. I cannot imagine how Adam must have felt. I'm glad her video did one thing. Show you all exactly the type of evil woman she is that a lot of us have experienced over the past few years behind the scenes. The mask has slipped. Everyone meet the real Colleen Ballinger. Adam also released a response video titled, Hi. It was a sort of parody video made to mimic Colleen Ballinger's response video where Adam took out a ukulele, sung off tune. So did you make a mistake or are you saying it's all lies? I don't know what the narrative of this video is. Mistake doesn't make them a terrible human. Makes them more human. A cruel one. He continued to note just how ridiculous and downright offensive Colleen Ballinger's response was. How is this allowed? 
This is one of the biggest YouTubers on the platform who is with a ukulele right now, singing a happy little song about being accused of children. Just disgustingly manipulative. You've made fun of us this entire video. You've made a silly little song about being accused of, of being very towards children. And as a person watching this unfold, I couldn't help but feel sad for Adam because he had probably at least somewhat wanted Colleen to respond like a normal human being, acknowledge that she had hurt him when he was a minor, that she had abused his love for her. This is someone that I loved so much. She pulled out a ukulele and called him a liar in front of millions of people. I mean, what do you even do with that? Colleen decided to make the serious accusations into a mockery for all to see. So the internet reacted to this with absolute shock, dismay, and of course, YouTube reaction videos. Didn't know what a f laughs was, so you, but I hope. Hope you're all having fun. Hope you're all having fun with that. People made AI versions of the Colleen Ballinger non-apology song. Just as long as it's entertaining to you. Right? You guys having fun? And if you didn't know the context behind the non-apology song, we're just viewing a lot of the memes behind it. He tricked into believing that a lot of this isn't serious. But this is not all fun and games. Because for years, online and in person, Colleen Ballinger was having inappropriate interactions with her underage fans. And while I am not personally a legal expert or a psychologist, there are experts in those fields who have reacted to her actions online. So let's see what those experts have said on this situation. There's a YouTube video titled Criminal Defense Lawyer Reacts to Toxic Gossip Train by Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and defense lawyer. And according to Runkle of the Bailey, in Colleen Ballinger's non-apology, she paints herself as the victim in the situation. Whereas from a legal standpoint, she's obviously seen as the main aggressor. Someone who views themselves as the victim when they're actually legally considered the aggressor, that's the sort of thing that gets you hammered on sentence. Considering how in Colleen Ballinger's non-apology video, she already referenced making past mistakes. Also, she's just admitted that there's something in her past. That's already an admission that on cross-examination, you could make all sorts of hay with. Colleen goes on to admit she was guilty of creepy and off-putting behavior, weirdly referring to herself as a creepy aunt at a family gathering. When Colleen says, I used to message my fans, but not in a creepy way like some of you are trying to suggest, but more in a loser way, Uncle goes on to say that this is a terrible admission. You So you were saying that you had inappropriate contact with your minor fans. That's an admission here. Lean also has a self-serving attitude in her non-apology video, saying that she felt it was important to tell her side of the story. I still felt it was important to come on here and defend myself a little. Drunkle says is one of the main ways people end up incriminating themselves. People say, I just felt it was important to tell my side of the story. That's how they explain that they talk to the cops. And often that is what gets them into even worse trouble. Like when Colleen admits to messaging her underage fans in her non-apology video. During the closing section of Colleen Ballinger's apology video, Colleen continues to emphasize the fact that she made mistakes. Have I made lots of dumb mistakes? Yes. Have I lots, made lots of dumb mistakes? Yes. Everybody has, every single person. But in the context here, this again is great fodder for cross-examination. Sometimes people make mistakes simply because they made a mistake. Is her literally admitting that she made these mistakes? But under this very serious context, 
People do not care at all about being forgiving when these allegations are this big of a deal. Towards the end of Runkle of the Bailey's video, states he cannot imagine at all that she ran this by her legal team. I can't imagine she actually ran this by her team and they said, yeah, go ahead. That's that's excellent. Uncle goes on to say there's no real way to know whether or not any of these allegations could be strung together as something that's worthy of a charge. But if one could be thrown together anyway, there is an absolutely massive amount of supporting evidence, especially through this video, that Colleen should be concerned if that did happen. But some of the allegations should have her in sort of a defensive posture, a position where she might realize, hey, I could get charged, I should be being careful. Important thing to point out is that YouTuber Onision is currently being sued for grooming. So really, who is to say that Colleen couldn't be sued for the same thing as well? Though I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. Child grooming is a federal crime, but oftentimes it has to be linked to the perpetrator having a sexual intent. The federal government defines grooming which is technically called enticement, as a method used by offenders that involves building trust with a child and the adults around a child in an effort to gain access to and time alone with them. If you are experiencing something like this, please talk to somebody, especially a therapist or a legal representative. Child grooming is not the only possible way that Colleen Ballinger could get into legal trouble. Again, I'm not a lawyer nor a legal expert, but it does seem like the victims involved in the situation could press charges as well or sue Colleen Ballinger. If Colleen Ballinger loses, she could end up behind bars or have to pay her victims, according to Medium. Colleen Ballinger's lawyers have allegedly sent out cease and desist as well, but according to those who have received the letters, those letters don't necessarily refute the allegations. So it doesn't seem likely that Colleen Ballinger will be taking any of the victims to court for defamation. But that's just my opinion. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Licensed therapist Mickey Atkins also covered the Colleen Ballinger non-apology in a video titled Therapist Deep Dive, How to Tell if You're Being Manipulated. Therapist unpacks Colleen Ballinger's non-apology. Mickey Atkins explains from a therapist's perspective why the Colleen Ballinger non-apology is so manipulative. In my opinion, this is becoming a thing that is more and more common in like influencer apology videos is this attitude that like I'm being victimized by being held accountable for my sh behavior, which is again, problematic and manipulative. Immediately right off the bat, Mickey states that even though body language is quite an unreliable field, as a therapist, she makes a point to discern how the opening body language of Colleen Ballinger staring at the camera absolutely oozes with contempt. It's like, look, look at this face that she's making. It just reads like it's oozing in contempt and resentment for her perceived or, or like proverbial audience, which is not a good sign. A lot of the behavior seen throughout Colleen Ballinger's non-apology video is really an attempt to provoke shame and guilt from the people who are calling out Colleen Ballinger on her actions. This seems like an attempt to create or provoke shame or guilt or embarrassment on behalf of the folks who are asking for Colleen to take accountability for her problems problematic behavior, which is fucked up. Mickey continues to inspect all the heavy-handed language being used by Colleen, which can be seen as manipulative to try and provoke a response from the audience where we see her as a victim. Like all of this like very heavy-handed language that's intended to provoke this emotional reaction where we as the audience view Colleen as a victim for being held accountable. And that sort of behavior has no place in a good apology. It's bad faith at best and like actively manipulative and active at worst. He points out that the definition of grooming from a clinical perspective is when an adult 
uses or utilizes that power imbalance in their position of influence and authority to manipulate a child or a younger person into doing something for them that's advantageous to the adult. It can include CSA or similar types of abuses, but it doesn't have to. Mickey points out that it's absolutely not necessary for this behavior to reach its worst stages in order for groom to be valid or true. The um, insinuation that it has to have reached the worst stages of a particular act in order for it to be valid is just not true. This is like a thing that we accept pretty universally about lots of other types of trauma. So I want to encourage people to integrate that into your understanding and like definition of grooming also. I am not a therapist or a mental health professional, but I recently researched in depth the practices of grooming because I wanted to educate myself not only so that I could see for myself how much they lined up with Colleen Ballinger's actions, but also so that I could possibly utilize this video in some way to spread awareness of these dangerous and manipulative practices and how they appear in your life in real time. Here are the stages of grooming. Whether it's an adult or a child, the stages of grooming by the predator towards their target are typically the same. Friendship forming. The predator will work to determine a target's candidacy by asking questions about the target's life and gauging their vulnerability, and also getting contact information such as social media handles or phone numbers, such as when Colin Ballinger first followed Adam McIntyre on Twitter. Colleen and Corey were doing a live stream and they stumbled across my Twitter account. This was the day before we officially started really talking. They found my Twitter so funny that they said they needed to send me bra and pants that Corey was wearing during the live stream. Relationship forming. The predator works to gain the target's trust. The predator may also share a secret that only the target can know, then ask for a similar secret to level the playing field. For example, when Colleen Ballinger would share with Adam McIntyre intimate details about her divorce and sex life. You have messaged me, virgin, pics, sexual position, period talk, like all this, sex with your ex-husband, Josh's penis size, all this. Threat gauging. The predator will engage in a risk assessment to determine how accessible the victim truly is. This is more common among predators who are grooming children, but can also happen with adults who will check a target's relationship strength with friends, family, and roommates. For example, when Colleen traveled to Ireland and wanted to visit with Adam and double checked to make sure that when Adam met her at a restaurant that his parents were not coming. And then I go, my parents are so mad and she goes, wait, are your parents coming? What's happening? I'm confused because the worst thing for Colleen is for my parents to be there because she can't talk to me inappropriately. Isolation. The predator will begin distancing the target from friends or family. This can be done in multiple ways, including surprisingly positive methods, such as compliments and favors. Colleen Ballinger would love bomb message Adam frequently. She would love bomb me, make me feel like I had a friend, pretend to care about me, and I would just have to do all of her dirty work for her. The predator may tell the intended victim that they feel an especially strong connection to them, which Colleen Ballinger did with Adam McIntyre or that they understand each other in a special way that no one else can get. Control is the predator's intent. By appearing calm and concerning, the predator is seeking to increase their influence over the victim to advance their agenda. Use. In this phase, the predator will start to use their target to meet their needs. With children, this is generally sexual in nature, but predators will use victims for money to accomplish morally questionable things for them or even just to fill an emotional need. Oftentimes, Adam was emotionally filling a need for Colleen Ballinger. So this is why I wanted to help. This was why I helped over the years because she would actively say that she was struggling with the character and I wanted to help my friend out. Then he helped her when she needed help with her Miranda Singh's account and did free work for her. And how many times she told me that she was going to bring me on as an intern, I cannot even count. Four years of work. Maintenance. Once the victim is doing what the predator 
their wants, the predator will work to keep them under control through various means. These methods can include gaslighting, telling the victim their feelings are crazy or unreasonable, destroying the victim's self-esteem, or continuing to isolate the victim from their loved ones. I mean, once Adam tried speaking out publicly initially, Colleen used all of her power and platform to try and silence him as much as possible. To then find out that within that moment she was running with this narrative against me and trying to ruin me within the fandom and get people to turn on me and call me someone that was just trying to ruin her career and take her down. It was not like that at all. The result of grooming to a victim can be catastrophic in terms of loss of self-esteem and personal safety, psychological trauma, and harm to the victim's financial resources and personal wealth. And almost all of these tactics, in my opinion, Adam clearly documented Colleen using on him. And instead of Colleen seeing that and apologizing privately, she tried to victimize herself tried to turn it all around as if her victims were the ones inflicting harm onto her in her public non-apology. Bring out the daggers made from your perfect past and stab me repeatedly in my bony little back. Which, as the lovely Swoop has noted in videos, as well as others, is utilizing Darvo abuse techniques. The definition of Darvo, originally coined by psychology researcher Jennifer Freyd, developed by other researchers in the Freyd Dynamics Lab. Darvo refers to a reaction perpetrators of wrongdoing, particularly sexual offenders, interestingly enough, may display in response to being held accountable for their behavior. DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse, Victim, and Defender. The perpetrator or offender may deny the behavior, like when Colleen said, doesn't matter if it's true or not. Doesn't matter if it's true though. Lies and rumors that you made up for clout. Attack the individual doing the confronting, reverse the roles of victim and offender, such that the perpetrator assumes the victim role and turns the true victim, or the whistleblower, into an alleged offender. Like when Colleen was using words as if her victims were attacking her, to the point that in her song, she was acting as if her victims were literally killing her. You tied me to the tracks and harassed me for my past. I won't survive in the crash. This occurs, for instance, when an actually guilty perpetrator assumes the role of falsely accused and attacks the accuser's credibility and blames the accuser of being the perpetrator of a false accusation. Throughout Colleen Ballinger's apology, Mickey Atkins shows that though Colleen Ballinger is clearly the perpetrator who has inflicted harm onto her victims, she continually tried to reverse the role, completely minimizing her actions. The only thing I've ever groomed is my two Persian cats. I'm not a even though a lot of you think so because five years ago I made a fart joke making her victims out as if they were these cruel monsters simultaneously singing and mocking them the irony of it all it is true darvo tactics at its finest all for the world to see Adam McIntyre allegedly posted onto the Colleen Ballinger snark subreddit a really moving post that I thought was important to read because it really shows just how hopeless victims can feel sometimes when these abuse tactics are deployed onto them. It also shows just how amazing it was that Adam continued to speak out. So Adam posted, it's Adam, just a couple of thoughts. When Colleen inevitably flips this around on me again, like she did in 2020, and tries to ruin my life again, and let's say everyone turns on me and hates me again, at least I know I've provided so many people the confidence to feel they can speak up against huge powers in their life, so it would have been worth it. Adam is definitely an inspiration because of that reason. Because Colleen has tried to do everything in her power to deflect and outright damage the victim's reputations through refusing to acknowledge the pain and the suffering that she has caused them. On July 10th, the entire Miranda Sings tour was officially cancelled. 
Pauline had 11 shows left in 2023 by the time the Colleen Ballinger allegations have gone mainstream. And when these shows were canceled, there was no statement from Colleen Ballinger or her team. Though I think they may have had bigger fish to fry by that point. I'm guessing Colleen Ballinger probably lost out on a lot of money over this, which is a major real world consequence from her actions. One of the biggest I've seen from a YouTube controversy, and personally, I'm glad to see someone have a real world consequence for greatly hurting their fans. If you hurt your fans, you should not be able to continually make money off of them. And on top of the tour getting canceled, sponsors also pulled out of their relationship with Colleen Ballinger. Pop Crave posted a tweet stating, Colleen Ballinger loses sponsorship deals with OneSkin and Zodok over grooming allegations. We have decided to cease the relationship completely. This behavior is appalling and we do not condone or support it in any form. BetterHelp also cut ties with Colleen. Haters back off, Colleen Ballinger's Netflix series, which we're going to talk about more later in this video, is still on Netflix, which is interesting. Now, when Colleen Ballinger's non-apology ukulele sing-song video first came out, a lot of people speculated that the entire purpose of it was to profit off of her demise in a final last hurrah exit video through copywriting the song and then claiming everyone who tries to make commentary videos about the apology song. It's really scummy and weird and like freakish to claim it because it's like an apology and it's supposed to be authentic and not something that she's making money from. But ultimately it's very fair use. Colleen Bollinger pulled an interesting business move that no one saw coming. Her ukulele song is now available to stream on Apple Music as well as YouTube. And it's been marked as copyrighted. At the time, some people speculated that Colleen had purposefully chosen to address the allegations with the song so that she would be able to claim copyright on people who use clips of it in other videos. And at first it was hard to believe that somebody could be that vindictive until it was reported that the song had been uploaded to iTunes. Then it was reported that the H3 podcast, who is one of the channels that was known to be interviewing a lot of the victims who were speaking out, got copyright claimed for a portion of their video where they featured her apology song. Ethan Klein at H3H3 Productions on Twitter tweeted, Colleen Ballinger uploaded Toxic Gossip Train to CD Baby and is claiming us. I said Colleen Ballinger uploaded Toxic Gossip Train to CD Baby and is claiming us. So here it is. She was generous enough to do her sharing revenue. Yeah, right. Guys, don't worry, I'm disputing. And you can see through the screenshots on the podcast's YouTube analytics where it shows Toxic Gossip Train as a song that was claimed, though there is technically no definitive proof that it was Colleen Ballinger specifically who uploaded this song to iTunes and claimed it. Though there is a screenshot on Apple Music that shows Toxic Gossip Train as an EP with the name Colleen Ballinger. On one of the screenshots that H3H3 Productions uploaded, it does say that it was CD Baby on behalf of Colleen Ballinger and that it allows for revenue sharing in what looks like every single country out there. And so if this was Colin Ballinger's doing, it does make you wonder if all of this was a ploy to make a profit off of this controversy that was going to be widely talked about. In a BuzzFeed article, Colleen Ballinger's legal representative said Colleen had nothing to do with the song being uploaded to Apple Music. The lawyer told BuzzFeed, Ms. Ballinger did not upload the song or video to Apple Music or to any other streaming platform for sale or for any other purpose. We don't know how it got published on those platforms. When Pop Crave posted about this claim, Ethan Klein tweeted it and said, can you please tell her legal reps that she still has our podcast claimed? So eventually the claim was dropped and Ethan Klein tweeted, Colleen or whoever was impersonating her dropped the claim. But the allegations get much more serious. After the non-apology and the internet's reaction to the non-apology, another allegation surfaced that a lot of people were not expecting. Thank you. 
July 3rd of 2023, Trisha Paytas released a video titled Colleen. So this is a video um, that I like really did not want to make. Addressing a serious situation, Colleen had been allegedly sending Trisha's unsolicited news to her fans in group chats and even hosting watch parties to make fun of Trisha Paytas's OnlyFans and sex work. They did viewing parties of my adult content to make fun of me. The allegations seemingly came out of nowhere and completely shocked everyone. And they're supposed to be friends. That's so mean. Right. No f***ing way, dude! So where did these allegations initially come from? These allegations first surfaced when Johnny Silvestri first posted on Twitter that Colleen Ballinger had sent him nude photos of Trisha when he was 22. So it is really important to know that Johnny was not a minor at the time that Colleen had sent him nude photos of Trisha Paytas. And it would later be revealed by him that he also participated in sending nudes of Trisha Paytas. If I'd find a photo, I'd follow Trisha. So if she posts something publicly, or sometimes I would literally just go to Google and type in like Trisha Paytas nude. This is a completely different matter than Adam McIntyre, who was a minor at the time when Colleen Ballinger allegedly sent Trisha Paytas's nudes to him in group chats. These photos were from Trisha's work accounts where Trisha Paytas was legally uploading them. Johnny posted proof of this, screenshots of the alleged text messages that Johnny had with Colleen where they talk about the photos of Trisha. Johnny also posted more screenshots of the alleged texts from Colleen Ballinger with what looks like X-rated videos from Trisha Paytas's paywalled sites. And Johnny described the chats as viewing parties for Trisha Paytas's all of these allegations were particularly shocking because at the time, Trisha Paytas had a podcast with Colleen Ballinger that they both started this year called Oversharing with Colleen and Trish. We want to do Oversharing because we both have overshared our whole lives on the internet. They appear to be somewhat friends, colleagues, or at least friendly with one another. So the fact that this was happening behind the scenes, that Colleen Ballinger was taking the work of her friend and sending it out to people to mock her behind the scenes is even more shocking, dismaying, and disappointing. But are we even surprised at this point? No, we are not. Now, of course, if you've been following my channel, you'd know that I've done a video on Trisha Paytas and some of the past mistakes that Trisha Paytas has done. But I also personally believe just because someone made past mistakes does not justify others sending their nudes in group chats or abusing them in that manner. I've done stuff in my past that's not cool by today's standards, you know? In my past video, I often noted Trisha's very rough childhood, the sexual abuse that she's noted she's endured in the past. As this commenter noted, just the fact that it's known that Trisha is a survivor of childhood SA and Colleen chose her images to further abuse minors is an extra special kind of twisted, especially since these being sent were unsolicited, which could constitute as revenge porn. Revenge porn, the act of posting someone's intimate photos online without their consent, is illegal in California, where Colleen Ballinger is based. So that's all to say I do not think Trisha Paytas is a perfect person, but what happened to Trisha Paytas at the hands of Colleen Ballinger is extremely unjust. Whether you agree with Trisha Paytas' past actions or not, just because Trisha Paytas made mistakes does not mean she deserves her unsolicited being spread by someone who pretended to be her friend. Johnny Silvestri, the person who originally brought these allegations public, made a Twitter post apologizing to Trisha Paytas about the entire situation, saying, To Trisha Paytas, I'm so sorry you had to learn about these things in a public light. Believe me, if I had a way of contacting you privately, I would have much preferred doing so. After hearing, Johnny participated in sending nudes of Trisha. If I'd find a photo, I'd follow Trisha. So if she posts something publicly, or sometimes I would literally just go to Google and type in like Trisha Paytas nude. 
talking with minors in group chats. Like, oh no, Johnny was in DMs with minors? I was. And participated in conversations where Colleen shared news of other fans. The girl who I was sent news of was kind of on a watch list. What? News of other fans who he admitted their unsolicited news were being sent around by Colleen, and he was complicit in it. It is hard to believe at this point that this is a sincere apology that we witnessed. It is hard to believe that Johnny's intentions weren't to make a public spectacle with these tweets that he shared of Trisha Paytas. I have to wonder what Johnny's intentions were with posting it all publicly. Trisha Paytas made a video recently speaking on how Johnny Silvestri releasing the photos publicly of her work made Trisha feel forced to speak about the issue publicly. And now I can see that those photos were posted um, with certainty to, to humiliate me, to force me into talking because he was so upset that I wasn't saying anything, that I wasn't talking, that this forced me to talk. Of course it was to, to humiliate me. Of course the pictures were to body shame. He was like, oh no, I didn't send the pictures to body shame. Oh, well, one time. There's no other reason to send that. He talked the way he talks about my photos being like she was with a big grin on her face. Like, <laughs> it's just, that is, that is manipulative. That is gross. That is disgusting. That is a, a, a form of just a forcing someone of humiliating them. Which is unfortunate. No one should feel forced to speak on such a sensitive matter. Unfortunately, when Colleen Ballinger was sending Trisha Paytas' unsolicited news to fans, at least one of those fans that we know of was a minor at that time. The text came out and the minor fan who is now an adult has said that those same pictures were sent to him. This is all alleged as I haven't seen anything. This is extremely serious. But I feel like this is beyond drama. I've had like a sick to my stomach feeling for a while now. I had nothing to do with this. I do not condone it. I think it's the most disgusting thing. In the video, Trisha talks about how she has a very hard boundary when it comes to dealing with minors and interactions with minors. It's a, it's a very hard, hard boundary. Like it's a very, it's one that I don't let up on with anybody. When Trisha tried confronting Colleen about this, Colleen blamed the sending of the photos on one of her fans, Adam McIntyre, and who was a minor at the time. She claimed would send the photos to her. She assured me that she had never sent photos of me. This one fan who was underage at the time would send photos to her. She's like, no, he was a fan. He sent photos to me. Which of course, either way, is extremely inappropriate. And any reasonable person, if a minor was sending them photos of their friend, would shut that down immediately and inform the friend that a minor was obtaining photos of them on their 18 plus paywalled site. In Trisha's video, she made it adamantly clear that she does not support any of what Colleen has been accused of and feels very deeply for all the victims. She says, this was the worst I've seen from someone I've considered a friend and it is downright cruel. In Trisha Paytas's recent podcast episode, she also supports Adam McIntyre. She writes about him saying, this trauma to a 14 year old is some irreparable damage. It's devastating. It can negatively impact him for life. You can dislike Adam, but he is 100% a victim in this and has every right to make a thousand videos if he wanted to. And in my opinion, Adam doesn't need to apologize for any of his actions as a minor. He was a child and still is very young to process all of this. In that podcast episode, Trisha Paytas also talks about how Colleen Ballinger sent her an apology message where Colleen admits that she did send those text messages, apologizes to Trisha for not admitting it sooner. She sent me an apology on that Saturday after I made the video. I made the video July 3rd and then she sent me an apology on like Saturday, July like 8th or ninth. Legally seems like a very dangerous thing to be admitting because of California's revenge laws and also the fact that she was sending them to Adam who was a minor at the time. Andrew Brettler, has your client Colleen Ballinger informed you that she has just admitted to a crime? 
because Trisha Paytas and I just went on the record saying that after Trisha made the video on Colleen, Colleen said, yes, it did happen. Yes, I'm sorry. And yes, I was acquired for lying to you. Trisha confirmed on July 8th in a video titled, This is Embarrassing, that her and Colleen's podcast oversharing with Colleen and Trish to an end after just three episodes. I don't get embarrassed by many things. Like obviously the podcast ending after three episodes is like embarrassing. Us doing all this is embarrassing. Which I don't think anyone was too shocked to hear, but I'm sure was still an embarrassing feeling for Trisha. Sometimes I just feel like a failure. And I am not a failure. I have lots of failures, but I'm not a failure. And I know that. I'm sure if you're trying to grow in your life, move on from drama, you have a child, you have a family you're trying to build, a stable life. You think you found another stable friendship. You start a podcast together, try and have a stable business venture, and then get swept up in one of the most chaotic and traumatic YouTube dramas of all time. And it almost sounds terrible to even call it a YouTube drama drama because it's even more traumatizing than that with real very serious allegations i'm sure that would feel embarrassing because you are unknowingly a victim in this situation the entire time i empathize with her that feeling of public embarrassment but at least the truth is out there and though it may be embarrassing it really should only be embarrassing for colleen ballinger who acted like a cringy mean girl behind the scenes for no reason I mean, really, what's the point of taking someone's nude photos and making fun of them with all your friends and literal children? That's embarrassing. I guess Colleen is right in that sense. It is loserish behavior. I'm just a loser. But it is also extremely creepy behavior. Can't wait to give all the dead Murfanda accounts that still follow me what they deserve. My revival era. 100% here for it. Already been done before. Need fresh concept. What about your YouTube career? Release my tell-all series and start a drama channel? Recently, more and more information has been coming out about the man named Johnny Silvestri, who I've mentioned earlier in this video, but I thought I'd dedicate a portion of this video to the story of Johnny Silvestri and the impact that he's had on the internet because Johnny Silvestri has harmed a lot of people. Whether it's content creators who have dedicated their platforms to covering this issue. I became part of this story. He liked to victims, he liked Adam, he liked to Becky, Ollie, everybody. So this has been a lot to process. Victims who have been associated with Johnny Silvestri. I take these things seriously. I take it seriously what happened to me and I'm not going to allow someone to completely steal my story and but say it's worse I have like this name or whatever it just ties me to the story I feel like this just becomes this like really dark dark tangled web and it's just like I think it's just it's just, like triggering and traumatizing for like a lot of people or private people who have been harmed by Johnny. So I feel a responsibility to cover Johnny's story more in depth in this video. In June of 2023, Johnny Silvestri connected with Adam McIntyre and told Adam McIntyre that he had similarities in his story and experiences within the Colleen Ballinger fandom and interactions with Colleen Ballinger and Joshua David Evans. I reacted to his first Colleen and Corey video because he really wanted me to on that call and I said that I would do it on my Twitch. I told him I would react to it and I said that my audience would send him so much support and then I would upload it to YouTube and he was so excited and I extended that branch to him. Whenever he spoke up, I still was so proud of him that I told him that I was willing to platform his story. Little did I know that he was doing that so he could build an audience off of my audience, which is what he did with a bunch of other people, so then he could take down Josh. Johnny Silvestri made a video about Colleen Ballinger and his experiences working on the Miranda Sings tour. But soon after, Johnny Silvestri's tone shifted to Joshua David Evans, Colleen Ballinger's ex-husband, 
and Johnny made a video which can only be described as directly going after Joshua David Evans. Johnny shared how he was given access to Joshua's social media account for a character that Joshua was doing, as well as how Joshua gave him a phone number at a meet and greet on a paper crown. He wrote his phone number on a little paper crown and after he signed it, he opened it up unprovoked and he wrote his phone number. Why is it that I don't know boundaries, Josh, but you were the one to sign this crown with Colleen and Miranda. You not only signed it, but you continued to open it up and write in it. I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but that looks like a phone number to me. Why did you give a 16 year old your phone number? You are the reason any of this happened. Eventually had run accounts for characters for you as a minor, not paid. But he even shared in this video how Joshua had issued him a private apology at this time. You're the one who sold me a fantasy you couldn't uphold. I still have the crown you wrote it on. All these aspects may had made initially the public feel like Johnny Silvestri's story was credible. So Johnny was interviewed by major news outlets like the Rolling Stone about his story and was often featured among the list of victims within the Colleen Ballinger story and Johnny Silvestri's claims began to escalate more and more, from simply that Joshua David Evans was inappropriate with him, to that Joshua David Evans groomed him. Meanwhile, Joshua David Evans was the only adult throughout the Colleen Ballinger saga who was actually apologizing and taking proper accountability. On June 29th of 2023, Colleen Ballinger's ex-husband supported the victims in a tweet that read, Anyone feeling hurt and gaslit right now? My message to you is this. Your experiences were real. The proof is there. Your trauma should be taken seriously. The proof is there. Your anger is justified. The proof is there. You deserve better. Take your power back sending you love. Joshua goes on to state how this behavior was also his reality. I assume he means during his personal relationship with Colleen. This behavior was my reality. Anytime I spoke up and disagreed with her actions and rhetoric during 2009 to 2016, I was gaslit too. I was made to feel like I was always the problem. Any pain I felt was an inconvenience and was belittled. Every ounce of what you're feeling, I understand. Joshua has continually owned up to his mistakes, which is more than any other adult has done in this entire controversy. And the fact that he was also a used and victimized by Colleen Ballinger makes this entire story so much darker and so much worse. Though we will never know the ins and outs of the relationship between Colleen Ballinger and Joshua David Evans, to the fullest extent, it seems that Joshua was treated horribly by Colleen, and for that I am so sorry. Honey Silvestri has been shown in interviews saying things that discredit Joshua's relationship trauma and domestic violence experience. He f***ed around and found out and now he's just upset about it. <laughs> Joshua goes on to state that he has no desire to use this entire situation as a catalyst for a comeback on YouTube. I have no desire to use this as a catalyst for a YouTube comeback. It's not a safe place for me. I'm past that. My voice is only here to help validate those that are hurting, nothing more. I have no need to make any money off of this. That is gross and not in my heart whatsoever. The internet initially reacted positively to Joshua David Evans' posts, praising him for his acknowledgement of the victims and accountability for whatever role he played in all of it. But quickly and swiftly, Johnny Silvestri interjected, ignoring any accountability that Joshua tried to take any apologizing that Joshua tried to make, only trying to further highlight himself, Johnny, as a victim. He was a dude pushing 30 who leached on to a vulnerable kid. Now it seems Johnny may have at times greatly exaggerated and other times outright falsified this information. For what exact reason it's unknown, though many feel it was to further push himself into the spotlight. Within these public apologies, Joshua David Evans continually apologized to Johnny Silvestri, but it's important to note that within these public apologies, Joshua David Evans 
Evans never apologized for grooming Johnny Silvestri or doing anything remotely close to that manner. Joshua David Evans simply apologized to Johnny Silvestri for interacting with him too much within the boundaries of the fan-creator relationship dynamic. According to the Rolling Stone, Evan acknowledged Silvestri's claims, posting a public apology to his Twitter saying he had acted inappropriately. My hope is that I can help remove some of the burden by acknowledging your experience and taking accountability. Evans also apologized for dragging other underage fans into to an abusive fan creator dynamic. Before I take a break for my own mental health, I also wanted to formally apologize to anyone else out there that got dragged into such an abusive the fan creator dynamic with me still processing how to rectify it just know you never deserved it and i hope you're finding peace but when johnny continued to publicly call joshua a groomer it got to the point that joshua had enough he had continued to apologize and still johnny was publicly attacking him making claims over something that joshua had never claimed to do when Johnny had gone on specific podcasts and continued to make these claims, finally Joshua had begun to tweet that Johnny was spreading misinformation. But people still believed Johnny. He was propped up by so many credible sources and was claiming really egregious things about Joshua. Johnny had claimed that for many years, Joshua had an inappropriate relationship with Johnny when he was a minor under the guise of wanting to mentor him. I think to this day, he has this skewed idea that he was being a mentor. Johnny claimed he went with his parents to meet Joshua at a car show. There was the one where we had our little coffee date at Starbucks when I went to the auto show to visit him. And then later, when Johnny was an adult, he went to see Joshua perform in California at a show in Irvine, where Johnny would come out to Joshua. That's the night that I told him, this was 2015, I'm gay. And he looked at me and said, well, that's none of my business. But besides these interactions, most of Joshua and Johnny's interactions were public facing. Their Twitter DMs have now been brought to light and show little interaction between the two. And Johnny openly admitted he hadn't texted with Joshua that often and that they had a mostly public relationship. And then you guys started texting like on a one on one basis. Not super regularly because I didn't want to use it. It was more of a public relationship. This conflicts with the very serious claims Johnny had been making that he had been groomed by Joshua David Evans, which would involve some level of a private relationship and inappropriate interactions that Johnny would have been able to bring to light. But he was unable to. You have obviously said uh, that you believe that Josh groomed you. Yes. Can you just give me a summary of exactly what Josh did that has made you feel that way? When he was in town, we did the Harlem Shake video. We filmed a little goofy, stupid video for my channel. There was a contest he did once. There were like maybe eight of us who submitted videos. I won and my prize was a ball of duct tape. The only things he was really able to prove were some photos of Joshua David Evans in video calls with minors, which as we now know, he has been doing the exact same thing this entire time. It is never okay to fake claims of abuse, not only because it can ruin someone's life, but because it can also cause harm to victims and their stories, and that is what all of this should be focused on. The victims of Colleen Ballinger. Because at the time of making this video, it seems publicly there have been no other reports or credible allegations of minors coming forward alleging that Joshua abused them. The villain Joshua David Evans was painted out to be was from Johnny and Johnny alone. All I'm left feeling after this information has come to light over Johnny Silvestri due to Swoop and her incredible research team is just wondering why. Why go through so much trouble to attach yourself to these victims, continually push yourself into the spotlight, and attack and practically defame a man who has done nothing but try to apologize to you for any hurt you may feel over the interactions they've had with you over the years, which seem to be very minimal. Ani Silvestri has been caught continually 
contradicting himself and his own involvement in causing harm within this toxic system of the Colleen Ballinger fandom. I remember it was around 2013 starting to see this Adam kid pop up. We just kind of picked on him for being so young. When it comes to Adam, Personally, I don't really think I partook. And saying things that seemed to prove that Johnny was just in it for the fame. Like how he struck out with Josh so Colleen can be his redemption. I struck out with Josh, maybe Colleen can be my redemption. Which, in the context it was clipped in this interview, seems to be a very strange thing to say. If Josh was someone who harmed you, why would you say that you struck out with Josh? And if Colleen was also someone who harmed you, why would you years later say that Colleen was your redemption? And what does that mean was your intentions with these people? Johnny continually attached himself to other victims so their stories would amplify his. She had her relationship with Adam while Josh was having his relationship with mine. They were probably both on their phones on opposite ends of the couch DMing minors. Which is not the purpose of what this story is. It's a horrific experience of when influencer culture can be damaging to children. It is not an opportunity to become famous. Johnny was also platformed by people who wanted to give these victims a chance to share their story. And it seems that maybe to Johnny, it was an opportunity to gain a following, which is really sad. Johnny Silvestri would not accept any of Joshua David Evans' apologies, which people began to notice as odd behavior. In fact, in general, people began to notice some of Johnny's odd behaviors. On top of his persistence in going after Joshua David Evans, even after Joshua's numerous apologies, people began to notice Johnny's inconsistent statements and wondered if there was more to Johnny's story. On the r slash Colleen Ballinger subreddit, the tone started to shift against Johnny Silvestri, but there was much more that was about to be uncovered. On August 17th, Swoop released a four-hour documentary on Johnny Silvestri that uncovered how Johnny was actually in group chats with minors the entire time that he was claiming that Joshua David Evans was inappropriate with him for even having spoken with him when he was a minor. Oh no, Johnny was in DMs with minors? I was. Not only was he in group chats with minors well into his adulthood, but he also was best friends with an alleged group named Tim Connolly, who was part of the Colleen Ballinger fandom and then went on to have very inappropriate conversations with minors in group chats and video calls. Johnny Silvestri even developed his own young fans off of working on the Miranda Sings tour but he longed to be part of the it group with Colleen Ballinger and would, according to Johnny's own account, bully other fans and alongside Colleen, participate in the sending of nudes of Trisha Paytas and even of another fan. Sometimes I would literally just go to Google and type in like Trisha Paytas nude. The girl who I was sent nudes of was kind of on a watch list all to be a part of Colleen Ballinger's circle. People were shocked at this turn of events, that Johnny was in fact not a victim at the hands of Colleen Ballinger and her ex-husband Joshua David Evans, but could have in fact been a perpetrator who perpetuated Colleen Ballinger's toxic ways. After Swoop's video, Johnny Silvestri made a statement saying that he feels betrayed by Swoop and that, basically, he'll be coming forward with more information soon. So so far, no information from Johnny has surfaced, and Johnny Silvestri has gone into hiding. Adam McIntyre seemed absolutely heartbroken to find out someone he had initially tried to uplift to try and help them share their story had really been lying and try and betray him. Adam released a video sharing his thoughts on the matter, how he had noticed that Johnny had been lying for some time and really Adam believes now that he was being used by Johnny so that Johnny could build an audience off of him, which is really sad and disappointing to hear. Any story I would say about Colleen Johnny would then come out with the same story about Josh, but it would be a hundred times worse to take away from my story. That is what Johnny wanted in all of this. Johnny wanted fame and attention in all of this. You want to know one of the things that Johnny said to me whenever he was planning on making his video on that call? How do I make sure that my YouTube channel is monetized? 
On the Colleen Ballinger Snark subreddit, someone from Swoop's team posted an update that reads, We began researching the Colleen Ballinger story at the start of June. We decided early on that much of the research should come straight from the source, including Johnny Silvestri, who you may have heard we interviewed for six hours in early July, following an hour of interviews conducted over Twitter voice notes in June. Despite the interview lasting as long as it did, part three was always intended to be an update on the story as a whole, which would include Johnny's allegations against Joshua as a section. However, following that interview, a few disturbing developments occurred that completely changed how we we were even planning on approaching part three in our series. We personally received three separate allegations against Johnny Silvestri, on top of discovering the allegations raised against him on another subreddit, and we were given reason to believe that Johnny actually doctored evidence he sent to us in our investigation to change the context of that evidence completely. One allegation we received was from a now adult who had been in group and video chats with Johnny as a minor, and has in fact known him since they were a teenager and was in his 20s. We have confirmed this person's identity many times over and believe them to be quite credible. They allege that Johnny was a participant in a series of group video chats with many minors from the Colleen fandom. According to Johnny himself, these chats began as Colleen fandom chats around 2018, but were eventually run by a man named Tim Connolly, a former Colleen fan himself and Johnny's former best friend of around 10 years. It's been alleged by our speaker that Johnny was a part of these chats for at least a year. Our speaker's description of the video chats included Tim consuming alcohol on camera while encouraging minors to drink on camera. Our speaker claims that some of the minors were young enough to not even know what a over was. Furthermore, the chats contained incredibly disturbing talks that ran the gamut from sex and romance to Tim weight shaming and body his fans. We managed to not only track down a video call Johnny, Tim, and underage fans did around that time dated April 14th, 2020 on Twitter, which is very recently. To cap this off, the person who reached out ended their message by stating that they were speaking to us because they are scared of Tim and Johnny retaliating, simply for them speaking out. We had discovered around mid-June that as a member of the Colleen live show, Johnny Silvestri had his own underage fans who would create group and video chats with him send him gifts and take photos with him at shows. A massive amount of public evidence of this was found on social media. This was confirmed by Adam McIntyre, who actually revealed to us that Johnny allegedly held his own unofficial meet and greets at Colleen shows. We have given Johnny multiple opportunities to tell the truth. We have publicly and privately supported Johnny and his story. We even gave him private advice that he should take accountability himself and and he chose not to. Or more specifically, he deflected accountability in a notes app statement he hid in the responses of an Elon Musk quote tweet. A Reddit user under the name Specialist Leg has posted a lot of information regarding some of Johnny Silvestri's inappropriate actions, as well as proof of some of Johnny's inconsistencies. For example, in 2020, when Colleen Ballinger released the video called Addressing Everything, Johnny Silvestri supported Colleen, replying to the video saying, proud of you. Specialist Legal also posted screenshots like how fans of Johnny Silvestri would post YouTube videos wishing Johnny a happy birthday. The most infamous group chat was the Johnny Stans group chat. There have been many various messages posted onto Reddit from this group chat. Most of them look legitimate, but many have been unverified. From what it appears, the Johnny Stans messages have gone on for many years, and it seems to be verified from multiple accounts that the Johnny Stans group chat is where most of the interactions took place. On August 24th, Swoop also posted a statement on Twitter saying, More victims have come forward privately, alleging that he, an adult, was inappropriate with them as minors, this time in person, beyond chats. 
The evidence they shared is deeply disturbing. I will never push someone to speak publicly, but if they do, please extend compassion. So it seems that Johnny may have tried to ruin another person's life and reputation. And this turn of events shocked everyone. For years, Johnny had a behind the scenes look into an incredibly toxic circle, the Colleen Ballinger circle, where abuse grew and bullying seem to be an everyday occurrence. We cannot forget that Colleen Ballinger caused so much damage in her wake. There are people she's recruited along the way, drafted into her team, taught her cruel and harmful methods, but Colleen Ballinger was the ringmaster. All the other players mentioned in this story, Johnny Silvestri, Corey DeSoto, Trent Ballinger, are members of her toxic circus. And for clarity's sake, I'm only saying that as an illusion and not to trivialize all the harm they have caused. So let's dive a little bit deeper into why Colleen Ballinger is YouTube's biggest creep. Big big trigger warning, especially for visual content that will probably be disturbing. As a defense lawyer, I'd be concerned in her shoes, and I would never put this out. One thing that's a very controversial aspect of Colleen Ballinger's Miranda Sings character that I didn't mention in the first video that I did on Colleen Ballinger because I didn't have definitive proof, and I didn't necessarily want to speculate on the subject without definitive proof, was the fact that for years people have been wondering whether or not Miranda Sings character has been a character used to mock those with disabilities. Colleen bases a lot of Miranda's traits off of him. It's Trent. I mean, she said it to my face. There have been rumors that those who have worked closely with Colleen Ballinger have said that she uses the character to mock those with disabilities, and people have been noticing a pattern within the Miranda Sings character. For example, on the Affinity website, there was an article written titled, Miranda Sings Needs to Stop Harming the Disabled Community, that was written back in 2017, that noted that the biggest problem is Miranda Sings' characterization. It's never been explicitly stated whether or not she has a disability. It could be said that her characterization is based off of harmful stereotypes of people from that community. She is portrayed in a way which highlights her disconnect with reality, and much of the humor produced is because of the fact that she is unable to comprehend certain ideas, or does something in an odd way. This is ableist. <laughs> Another question for the scientists. If anybody knows how to get rid of babies that you don't want, um, please tell me. Much of this was speculative and wasn't tied to anything concrete until recently when Johnny Silvestri, who worked on the Miranda Sings tour and closely with Colleen Ballinger and participated in a lot of group chats with Colleen Ballinger, confirmed these rumors in a tweet. And now we know. Johnny Silvestri was even closer with Colleen Ballinger, so of course he would have inside knowledge of her intentions with the Miranda Sings character, as he participated in many group chats and conversations where much of the bully-like behavior took place. In this tweet, he said, She bases pieces of Miranda off of her disabled relative. She literally told me that to my face it's not mine that when Trent has tantrums I like to study them and take mental notes so that I can incorporate them in Miranda's wow. act her characteristics the way she talks if you see a, Mar a Miranda video where she's upset visibly angry and having an episode she's mocking her own brother <laughs> So while Colleen Ballinger claimed publicly that the Miranda Sings character was based off of the sort of popular girls who thought they could sing. Like these teenage girls posting the same songs that I had sung in performance, but alone in their bedroom. Acapella. Acapella, um, changing lyrics and doing whatever they wanted with them. And they were terrible, but they were so 
Kelly. All the while, allegedly, behind the scenes, she was really making fun of a relative the entire time. Then she turned this character into a way to make inappropriate content that lured in a child audience. Colleen ended up exploiting for her own gain. Miranda? I mean, really, what good did Colleen even do with her content? I can't personally see any positives with this situation. Colleen's most recent defense of her content has been that her content is not for kids, which is why it's not on the YouTube Kids app. And that's why you won't find my videos on the YouTube Kids app anyway. And that actually her content is rated PG-13 and has always been rated PG-13. She's PG-13. It says that on my website and it's always been that way. Which initially I had taken at Facebook value. I don't know why I took this at face value, but looking back, I think personally, Colleen Ballinger tried to gaslight the entire internet in her non-apology video. And let me break down why. I don't use the word gaslight lightly. I know that's overused and I often don't use mental health terminology flippantly, but I think in this context, it's fairly used. Colleen said you wouldn't find her content on the YouTube Kids app, but almost immediately, people found that not to be true and posted on the Colleen Ballinger snark subreddit how her content can be found on the YouTube Kids app. Posted by underscore Craigular Joe. Here's a screenshot of Miranda Singh's content on the YouTube Kids app. Miranda Singh's content being listed as PG-13 can't be found anywhere on her website, at least that I could personally find, or it seems that anyone else could find. So parents aren't being warned, or at least aren't being easily warned, when they go to buy tickets to her live shows, that the shows are intended for viewers 13 and older. On the Netflix streaming platform, Miranda's recorded live show is rated TV 14, which means it contains content that most parents would find appropriate for children over the age of 14. Peter's Back Off, on the other hand, is rated TVPG, which means children of all ages should watch with their parents, not just children over the age of 13. So not all of Colleen Ballinger's content is PG-13. In fact, the biggest production that she has ever done or took part in is rated TVPG. She just calls for some parental guidance if you are a child of any age, which I don't know, I would think is a pretty major difference and something that Colleen would know if she worked on the project and was the entire face of it. On top of that, you can find haters back off in the kids section of the Netflix app and interface. And it gets worse. When you watch Colleen Ballinger's Netflix special, in the first 20 seconds of that special, I saw more five-year-olds featured in those first 20 seconds than I think I've seen in my entire life. Colleen Ballinger gets up onto the stage. She's visibly pregnant in this special. And around two minutes into the special, the very first joke that Colleen Ballinger says, the first joke that she makes up on stage, after you witness the crowd coming in with all the parents and all the five-year-olds filling the seats, Colleen Ballinger gets up on stage, talks about how she's pregnant and that there's a tiny penis in her, and then says, is there kids in here? In a obviously sarcastic tone, because she obviously knows that there's a bunch of kids in there. There's a tiny little penis in there. Is that weird? Are there kids here? First joke of the entire special is about a tiny penis 
inside of Colin Ballinger in a room filled with probably the most children that I've ever seen in my entire life, or at least for a comedy special, at least definitely for a Netflix comedy special. Then seven minutes into the Netflix comedy special, you'll never guess what happens. Colleen Ballinger pulls out a ukulele and says that that's her universal solution. Whenever she's receiving hate, she writes a song about the hate she's getting. I'm comfortable when it comes to confrontation and hate, but I'm a little bit better at it when I can hide behind my camera like a coward. So I write songs about the hate that I get. Foreshadowing. Why are you a YouTuber? I'm not a hater, I just hate your vids and your voice. You look uglier than my ass. No points. But either way, Colleen Ballinger bringing up this PG-13 fact is a complete red herring and a distraction from the main point. Because Colleen Ballinger knows regardless that her main fan base is children. She knows every time she steps on stage, her live shows and stares into a child audience. She knows when she goes to her meet and greets and sees a sea of children screaming with excitement to meet her. She knew when she messaged with underage fans inappropriately and then wrote a ukulele song about it. Many years ago, I used to message my fans to turn around all of a sudden and act like your content was never intended for kids. And for years, you have seen firsthand who has followed you. I just don't understand what she was trying to do there. Even in that Netflix special, Colleen Ballinger acknowledged multiple times that it was children who were attending her shows or parents who were begrudgingly taking their children to her shows. I get a lot of hate from the mothers. Hi. You all say the same thing to me when you meet me too, the moms. <laughs> and I think you think this is a compliment, but you always say, I don't know why my kid likes you. Why does it even matter what your rating is? whether your content is for children or isn't for children. Of course, it matters in terms of how appropriate or inappropriate your content is, but there's also more to the story. Because in traditional media, there have been actual laws that have been passed regarding children's content. The level of advertisement and how much educational content there should be surrounding children's content. And there's been a larger debate about how much that should apply to children's content online. But the good thing is YouTube is aware that they have a responsibility towards children and the content that children watch, which is why the YouTube Kids app exists. Your kids are presented educational content to a certain extent and somewhat safe content that is monitored for them. Here's what Google says about content policies for YouTube kids. The YouTube Kids app is designed to be a safer and simpler place for kids. The app is a filtered version of YouTube. We work to identify content that is age appropriate. We do not allow videos in YouTube Kids that includes paid product placements or endorsements. This aspect of the kids app aligns very similarly with the FCC's guidelines for kids content in broadcasting. Overly commercial content. Content that is overly commercial or promotional is not allowed in YouTube kids. But again, as Colleen noted in her apology, you can't find her content on the YouTube kids app. And that's why you won't find my videos on the YouTube kids app anyway. Doesn't mean her content isn't directed at kids. I mean, Look at the tons of children who show up to her shows and her meet and greets. The reason why most of Colleen's content is not on the YouTube Kids app is because Colleen does not want to adhere to YouTube's strict guidelines in order to appear on the YouTube Kids app. But what Colleen Ballinger has done is far more sinister than that, really, and speaks to a more dangerous aspect of influencer culture, especially when your audience is made up of children and you have no concept of boundaries. Because in traditional children's media, there's usually a figurehead that's seen as somewhat inaccessible. Think of someone like Spongebob or Power Rangers. Growing up, you idolized these characters on a show. 
but it was nearly impossible to form parasocial relationships with them, at least I would hope, because there's only a certain level of access that you're granted to into the world of a Power Ranger, and SpongeBob isn't in a group chat with you. At least if that was happening, it probably wasn't SpongeBob and was a very weird creeper catfisher, but a YouTuber, well, a YouTuber, you can get to know everything about their life. You can have a relationship with them, which a child can completely interpret the wrong way. You can go on tours and meet and greets, see them and talk to them, and even message with them if they really have no concept of boundaries. And you can form this really deep, one-sided bond and all of it, a child could completely misinterpret. According to an expert interviewed by the Rolling Stone, Ballinger, like other early YouTubers, was doing it all without establishing rules, according to Jamie Cohens, an assistant professor of digital culture and media at Queens College, especially when it came to how they interacted with fans. The earliest YouTubers had no real guidance, they were these mostly white kids that were basically saying, oh, we're fighting back against the gatekeepers, essentially inventing the platforms as it went. They made their own rules. And at some point, YouTubers learned that parasocial relationships are their success model. And Joshua Evans, Colleen's ex-husband, summed it up perfectly when he said, that's what made YouTubers different from celebrities you could talk to them, and they would talk back. We took pride in that, he continued, but in retrospect, it's dangerous. And it can be perceived inappropriately because a lot of it was inappropriate, and it just evolved from being something simple into something very much that you should not be engaging in. And those teens and children, they don't know that it's not right. They don't know that they should be pulling back as well. That's the adult's job. And the sad truth is no one was doing that. No one was pulling back. No one was thinking, how is this affecting them? How attached are they getting? Even back in 2018, someone by the name of Amit attended one of Colin Ballinger's shows along with his wife and live tweeted about how disturbed he was about how many children went to the Miranda Sings show and how inappropriate the content was at the show. So let's read some of those tweets. Wife and I got tickets to see a comedian we really like. The entire crowd are children with their parents. We are very confused. Already have plans on how to evacuate in case this is indeed a show for kids. This is one of the most awkwardest moments in my entire life. Average age in our row, 10, including us. She's starting. Children are screaming. I'm deaf. Holy shit. She just called one of the moms a dick. Oh my God. This is definitely not a show for kids. The theater is filled with shocked and pissed off parents. Oh my God, this is amazing. There is a whole monologue about porn going on. All the parents just sighed. Children are cheering. This is beyond amazing. She just brought a girl from the audience on stage and told her that she's dressed like porn. This is so effing amazing. The word tactical crap was said. She just asked for boys to come to the stage. Dads want in too. There's not enough popcorn in the world right now. She wants help from the crowd to perform her own birth. Children are going ape shit. A shy looking teenage boy from the audience is going to play the role of her mother. Her, what is this smell, mom? Are you cooking cabbage? Boy reading from a script. No, this is my placenta. Just heard the mom next to us going, what the f now it's a giant parody on Disney songs. Children are losing their minds. Again, the entire crowd are kids. This is effing amazing. Show is over. At Miranda Sings at Calling B123 is a role model for every child in this world. Wow. Just effing wow. Thank you to Amit for really showing and documenting. First off, the amount of children in the audience, very, very young children, under the age of 13, 
but also for documenting just how inappropriate the live shows have been for children for quite some time. I think what has upset people the most about Colleen Ballinger's shows particularly have been the various segments that Colleen Ballinger has done, most of all because of Becky, who was put in an extremely compromising position after being invited up on stage for the yoga bit portion of one of Miranda Sings' live shows and who documented her experience in a TikTok, feeling extremely uncomfortable and traumatized with the entire experience, especially because she was under age at the time. In this video, I was about 16. She spreads them so far that you can see the spandex I was wearing under my romper, which thank God I was wearing. That is the moment I will never forget where I was laying under Colleen and she was smirking down at me while thousands of people were laughing and I was terrified that my body wasn't covered enough up enough by the spandex. I basically felt naked, so it felt incredibly sexually violating. I was younger and my body was still developing and I was still becoming comfortable with myself so for her to use my body as entertainment on stage really set um, my confidence back quite a lot. On top of that, there are a lot of very bizarre and strange segments of Colleen Ballinger's live shows. There's the porn segment. critiques young girls for wearing anything that shows any amount of skin on their body and how Colleen Ballinger does that is by bringing them up on stage and pointing at them and saying this is porn. This segment is reserved solely for young adolescent girls, which makes you wonder what that does to their self-esteem, bringing shame and the concept of shame into their life. And there's the date segment, where Colleen Ballinger brings up onto stage mostly very young boys and takes them on a date. I brought no help with me and I was just wondering, well, shouldn't you know if you brought it? <laughs> I'm just getting things, I'm just getting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm hitting the sack in the perfect place, literally. Love him. I can't believe I'm reaching in there right now. Which involves, at times, having these young boys grab cheese balls out of Colleen Ballinger's pants. All of these segments involve very physical things. With a young person's body, why do you need to be doing so many physical activities with minors on stage like that? Hmm. On top of these interactions in person, we cannot forget that Colleen continued to text her child fans, creepy things, and group chats and private text messages, particularly the infamous group chat that was named the Weenies group chat, saying things like, are you a virgin and what's your favorite sex position? Adam also posted a very upsetting message that Colleen Ballinger posted in the Weenie group chat onto Twitter. The Weenies group chat, consisting of mostly 13 to 17 year olds I was a part of with Colleen, all had an inside joke Colleen started to do with periods or some sh and she sent us this video and all of us had to go out and buy tampons and reenact it for the group chat. It was so effing weird. And then Adam provides a video of Colleen putting a tampon into her mouth, which is very bizarre. A very bizarre thing for a grown woman to be sending in a video to 13 to 17 year olds. I'm sure you're wondering, how did this all fly under the radar? Well, Colleen made creepy, inappropriate jokes online for a really long time. Asian woman with facial hair. Please don't sit next to me, please don't sit next to me. And I turn around and there are no open seats on the plane, so of course she comes and sits right next to me and on me. Hi, hello. Hola, Miranda, ¿cómo estás? Hola, welcome back. Like a big black woman. You're the best woman in the world. The best what? Right, she has no age. Anyway, so I'm going to.
Now, while I briefly mentioned about this in my previous video, I felt the need to dive deeper into the Sam and Labia series and censor these videos less so that you can really grasp the gravity of how disturbing these videos are. Now, Sam and Labia were a duo by Colleen Ballinger and her best friend, Corey DeSoto. Hi, welcome to Arts and Crafts with Sam and Labia. Hey, where they pretended to be arts and crafts enthusiasts, teaching others how to do DIY projects to their mainly child fan base. Except all of these videos have extreme sexual undertones to them, especially the video I'm about to show you. In this video, Sam and Labia, AKA Colleen and Corey, make love boxes. So today we're going to teach you how to make cute little mailboxes so you can send notes to your loved ones at home. Which are basically intended to look like vag The boxes have flesh colored paper wrapped around them. My box is a little smaller. Will it fit big notes? Of course it will, as long as the slit's big enough. And they say over and over again how they're going to make slits in their boxes. You need to cut a nice little slit in your box so that your loved one has a place to put all their fun things. I want mine stuffed full, so I'm gonna do a large slit. And then stuff things into their slits. If you wanna make sure that your slit is nice and smooth, just take a fun little note and move it in and out of your little slit. They stick things in those holes, draw things that look sexual in nature all over the boxes. And then Corey puts his mouth all over the hole of his box. There's a whole bunch of red stuff coming out of my box. I think I'll just eat it out. Then at the end, Colleen offers her box as a giveaway. But if you'd like to win my box, Laby and I will put some fun little notes in it for you. And all you have to do to win is subscribe to the channel, leave a comment below, and click on the link in the description to tweet the video. And here are some more videos of Sam and Labia that have a lot more innuendos and sexual jokes. Like one where they teach you how to make decorated wooden spoons. I always like it tight. Once you know that it's on there firm and tight, you want to make sure that you rub it on. Do you want to feel my fuzzy balls? Very soft. Your cock is looking really nice. Thank you. Can I pet your pussy? Or this video where they make DIY Halloween costumes, but make sexual jokes the entire time. Talking about a pussy, a taco, a winner. I mean, you know what they're talking about. The internet was making my head so big. I couldn't even fit through the back door anymore. It wasn't enjoyable with your head so big, Libby. We used the back door because Sam's pussy tries to escape through the front. And around three minutes into this video, they make a ghost costume and put it on Corey in the most disturbing scene in a video that I have ever seen personally. Here I have a very special ghost. The mouth is wide open, ready for the howling. For the mouth. Oh. Watching this, you both know that your demographic is child viewers. Sam and Labia also made arts and crafts panties that were inspired by Taylor Swift's Bad Blood music video. So for our craft today, we thought we would make some um, Taylor Swift inspired. Bad Blood panties. Not shorts, as Taylor Swift is clearly wearing in the music video, but they specifically called them panties. Who doesn't like a pair of bloody panties? Then they go on to try and make these bad blood panties look bloody with red glitter. We have some red items to add, red glitter glue, red circles, squirt some of this on. Hey, you can't forget the dots. Again, this is just kind of weird content to be making for your child audience. The bloopers that they post are even weirder and clearly show the intent of what they were trying to do with their videos. We're not even like slightly doing sexual innuendos. This one is just straight up. Yeah. Make a penis in a vagina. The whole time the bloopers are playing with this happy, upbeat music that makes it even creepier. That's why I'm putting bouncy bolt stickers all over my box with you. Because I know how much you love balls on your butt. <laughs> there it is, there it is. Sam and labia aspect to this is, to me personally, the creepiest aspect. Because it shows that they were talking sexually 
out in the open for years, consistently, publicly for everyone to see. They were doing this out in the public. Just no one noticed is all. So of course they were doing it in group chats as well. The bad blood video that they did has over 900,000 views. They were even celebrated for their content. They were celebrated for it. The other thumbnails that I heavily censored in my last video were thumbnails that Colleen had posted from her Christmas vlogs. Literally vlogging her family over Christmas where she had posted little girls from her family in the thumbnails with very disturbing titles. The girls look like they could not possibly be over the age of six, and the titles read Girl on Girl Action, Xmas Vlog 2, and Sexy Pole Dancer, Xmas Vlog 11. Audience was Colleen Ballinger trying to draw in by putting young girls in the thumbnail with titles like those. Throughout Colleen and her extended family's time on YouTube, since they've heavily participated in family vlogging, there have been a lot of questions as to whether or not they've exploited their children online through overexposing them on the internet. Of course, there's a larger debate to this, but I do think personally questions need to be raised because it's at the least very concerning. It makes me wonder, there's been allegations of Colleen Ballinger exploiting minors within her fandom. She'd be willing to exploit minors within her own family. I'm concerned for the children within Colleen Ballinger's family due to the patterns of inappropriate behavior and inappropriate interactions with children displayed not only by Colleen, but by other members within Colleen's family as well. Allegations against Trent Ballinger, Colleen's brother, have also come out recently. Oliver, who is a former fan of Colleen Ballinger's, told the Rolling Stone that Colleen's motto of spreading happiness drew him into the Colleen Ballinger fandom. But after joining in 2018 and following Colleen Ballinger and all of Colleen Ballinger's family on the site, a follow back from Colleen Ballinger's brother Trent quickly turned into constant communication between the two. At this time, Oliver was 13 years old. So just the fact that Trent followed back a 13 year old is very odd behavior. Then the fact that Trent messaged back and forth this 13 year old again is very odd behavior. Trent would go on to message Oliver about Oliver's duality, sending Oliver is again very inappropriate messages to ask a 13 year old. Messages reviewed by the Rolling Stone show over a year's worth of communication. Trent complimenting Oliver's looks him for photos, telling him to text anytime. Anything we talk about stays between you and I. It has been noted that Trent is disabled, though many feel like it's not an excuse for grooming someone, especially when you're sending messages that makes it clear that you know better. I was confused, but I brushed it off, Oliver told the Rolling Stone. I was too scared to tell my mom because I didn't want her to take away my phone and not trust me. And even when I started to become uncomfortable, I kept thinking to myself, this is Colleen's brother. So many people in this fandom would probably love to have messages from him. Other messages from Trent are things like, I'm told not to talk to people under 18. I do so just to spread positivity. How old are you? 13. Night, don't let this reality bite. So there's lots of questions that I have about the family, the strange behavior that they've exhibited overall, especially because on top of that, Colleen and her sister have done tons of strange thumbnails and collaborations together, which makes me wonder what sort of behavior has been normalized within this family. Another strange aspect of Colleen Ballinger and the content that she's made on her channel is her consistent collaborations with Jojo Siwa. To preface this, she's also said at one point that if she was Santa Claus, she'd want the girls from Dance Moms to sit on her lap. If you were Santa, name three people you would want to sit on your lap. If I were Santa, I would want the girls from Dance Moms. It sounds super creepy, but it's totally innocent. I just think they're adorable and super talented. Saying that that makes her sound creepy and pet. 
stylish. This is gonna sound so creepy. My answer is so creepy, but I don't mean it to be creepy. I can't admit this. This sounds so stylish. Then went on to collaborate with Jojo Siwa, who was a girl from Dance Moms multiple times on her channel. On top of that, she made a video with her sister testing out Jojo Siwa products in a bathtub together. Then when she went on to collaborate with Jojo Siwa, her interactions with Jojo Siwa are very uncomfortable, if not very disturbing. And also further go to show that the Miranda Sings content is very much so directed at children because Jojo Siwa at the time was for child audiences. So if you collaborate with Jojo Siwa, you're going to get more child viewers. One of the collaborations starts off with the Miranda Sings character criticizing Jojo Siwa for wearing shorts and a long sleeve top, which is pretty normal for a 13 year old not supposed to dress poor when you were dancing. I can see her entire legs, Miranda says. Next thing is you are not supposed to dress when you are dancing and I can see your entire legs. Stop it! Teaching preteens the concept of body shaming is just a very weird concept to me. So Jojo changes into longer pants. Miranda says, I'm just now realizing that your shirt says milk all over it. You drink milk? You know that comes from a private part. Also, I'm just now realizing your shirt says milk all over it. You, know, you drink milk? Yes. You know that comes from a private part? And later in the video, Jojo does the splits and Miranda says, whoa, did you hurt your tukey? When Jojo asks what a tukey is, Miranda gestures to her crotch. Whoa, did you hurt your tukey? What's a tukey? Then when Jojo does the splits a second time, Miranda says, we need to stop before she hurts her tukey permanently. Give me that. We need to stop before she hurts her tukey permanently. Colleen and Jojo filmed a second collab video on Jojo's channel on that same day. In this clip, Jojo teaches Miranda how to twerk. Stop, don't look at her. Do not look at her that way. You cannot do that. Why not? That will entice all the people. And Miranda asks Jojo in that video, have you ever taken the pants off and seen what's inside? Okay, well that's because you're wearing pants. Have you ever taken the pants off and seen what's inside? And very visibly confused, Jojo asks, in public, no. On the toilet, yes. In my own privacy, yes. To which Miranda asks, and before the scene cuts. In public, no. On the toilet, yes. And? In my own privacy, yes. And? The other videos together, Miranda and Jojo have a slime war together where their two chests get stuck together with slime in a scene that Colleen dramatically slowed down before re-uploading. What was your intention of that? In another collab, the Miranda Sings character and Jojo play a game of Never Have I Ever. Many of the Never Have I Ever statements revolving around kissing, boyfriends, and body parts. Never have I ever not had a boyfriend. Never have I ever had a crush on a YouTuber. You have never kissed anybody? Never. Jojo. Really inappropriate topics for a 13 year old. I just really hope that these videos did not put Jojo Siwa in an uncomfortable situation. And I really hope that their relationship off camera was not even more uncomfortable than it seemed on camera. But also on top of that, what precedence are these videos teaching other children that it's okay for a grown adult to say statements like that to children? Because it's not. It's not okay for a grown adult to ask a child about their tukey or stick their chest to a child's chest with slime or ask about boyfriends and kissing and body parts. Colleen Ballinger's book is also deserving of a deeper look. There's the hot dog page, which Colleen Ballinger said she wanted to look like a bloody vagina. It teaches you how to draw a hot dog when it's supposed to look like a vagina. And just the pages with a 
coupon and a pad with zero context. In her book, she also showed crime scene style pictures of herself sleeping, pictures that her uncle took of her, which look really creepy. There's also this page that's extremely off-putting with the title Fun Activities. Sometimes you have to do things with kids. These few activities can be fun for you and your children. Hide and seek. Have your kid hide and then do something else while they're distracted. The child is underneath a recliner chair. Playing dress up. You can have them dress as a dog or a homeless. A child child on a leash. Play horsey. Looks fun, right? Miranda playing horsey with a child. Makes me uncomfortable. The photos of the kids, the way Miranda's on top of multiple children, a leash on a kid while the child is crawling on the ground. Don't love it. There's also a page of Miranda's uncle's house, a very private place where you can play with your daddy saddle, which is something that apparently Miranda and her uncle use together. How much money do you have? What diseases run in your family? Types of yarn, do you mind? award. Miranda and her uncle. Jane's obsession with linking her character Miranda and Miranda's uncle extends beyond her books and into her content for many, many years. Uncle Jim, get on the ground! <laughs> it's always implied that they, their relationship is a little too close and it's a little a little rapey. <laughs> One of Miranda's longest running bits is that she has a strange relationship with her uncle, which why? It's not funny, endearing, or entertaining. It is just creepy. At a live show, Miranda, pretending to be her uncle, says she's excited for a little girl to be born into the family because the uncle loves little girls. Oh, I'm so excited for you to give birth to this baby. I love little girls. <laughs> Colleen made a post as Miranda with the caption, so mad at my uncle for this, saying, last night after you cuddled me, you put my gum at the side of the bed. Last night after you cuddled me, you put your gum on my bed. Then there was also this tweet encouraging incest, saying STFU the fun uncle. Unlucky Pickle on TikTok posted a great comprehensive deep dive into some more disturbing posts that Colleen has made talking about her uncle. I recommend watching the full video on her TikTok page, but I'll play some of the clips here. One of his favorite things to do is tickle attacks, and also he likes to cuddle attacks, so those are really fun for me. I have pink eye. I am really unhappy about it. It really hurts, and I'm pretty sure I got it from my uncle. I just want to eat some apple strudels. And my uncle keeps making me wheels. Yeah, that's about as bad as I remember. Pauline even made a rap as Miranda about how much she loves spending time with her uncle. Swim, rap, and sleep, sing, and share gum. My uncle wants to cuddle me until he sleeps. Nope. Nope, that's it. I've had enough of her. There was also the Slurpee bath video, which is just a very, it, it, it was a very weird video. My uncle and I go down to 7-Eleven, get a lot of Slurpees, and I get to take a bath in it, so. My uncle and my mom taught me about this, is that you cannot eat this kind of Slurpee, the spinning game. <laughs> Recently, one of the biggest debates surrounding the Colleen Ballinger controversy has been one of Colleen Ballinger's YouTube videos from 2018 that's been unlisted that's resurfaced, in which Colleen performs a cover of Beyonce's single ladies as Miranda sings in face paint. <laughs> several Twitter users posted about this clip saying that it really looks like Colleen Ballinger is using blackface in the video. But according to Andrew Brettler, an attorney for Colleen Ballinger, 
face paint was actually green. The reason why being Colleen Ballinger had just performed Wicked, where she was in full green face paint and makeup, and then afterwards had done a quick change, had come out, but still decided to keep part of her face green. Keep that in mind. She still kept part of her face green to come out and perform single ladies. No one else had green face paint on, just Colleen Ballinger as she's performing single ladies. Now I've seen a lot of debate back and forth. I've seen some people say green face paint or not. This is still clearly blackface. And I've seen other people on the other side saying, even bringing this up and claiming it's blackface is distracting from some of the legitimate things that Colleen Ballinger is doing because it gives Colleen and her attorneys an out, something that they can direct all of their attention and energy to, to defute. In my personal opinion, I think that this video still has very strange optics. I mean, if you're doing any sort of costume change and you know that you're going to perform Single Ladies, which is a song made by a black woman, and you have any sort of face paint on, why not just take a makeup wipe and wipe off the face paint on your face? If you know that you're doing a Beyonce cover after performing Wicked. Growing up, I was a ballet dancer, so I know a little bit about stage performances. And looking at that green face paint, it's just terribly done too. So it's like you couldn't have had one stage person or dance mom or someone backstage take off that face paint really quickly before performing single ladies. I mean, you could have tried harder. Also, the person who originally posted the claim of blackface has now been receiving a lot of hate, which I also think is unfair because at first glance, the green looks similar to black. It's reasonable for someone to think that and make that mistake. Also with stage lighting, green can look very similar to black. And of course, that's the only allegation that Colleen Ballinger's lawyers are jumping on so quickly and refuting. What about all the other allegations that have been made? Me that just says that Colleen is guilty of all the other allegations if the only thing her lawyers can refute or deny is just saying, Actually, that paint is green. And according to Josh, Colleen Ballinger's ex, this was all intentional as a way to do blackface without actually doing blackface. As was posted in the Colleen Ballinger snark subreddit by minimum underscore step underscore 6787, Joshua confirms her accidental blackface was intentional. He tweet replied to Paigey, in support of you, your mental health, and to help clear your name, that bit is intentional. It's as if the character doesn't get it while she continues to perform a black artist song with stuff on her face. The audience is like, what? While the character is like, what? I hope you are okay. So from what it sounds like, what Joshua is saying is that even though Colleen Ballinger wasn't fully doing blackface in that video, doesn't mean that the intention behind what she was doing wasn't there. So the whole debate over whether it was green or black paint distracts from the discussion at hand. And the hate that the creator Pagey's receiving for this may not be justified. Colin Ballinger created the character Miranda Sings as a character that sort of stumbles upon unintentional racism. So throughout the Miranda Sings comedic career, there's many bits that have unintentional racism, though it's all very intentional and very designed. And it's all designed to make the audience uncomfortable. The Miranda Sings character pretends to be completely oblivious to how racist she's being throughout these bits. It's Miranda Sings' oblivious racism is something that Colleen Ballinger has written up into skits very often. Whether she posts as Miranda Sings, uttering gibberish while pretending to talk in another language. Ya no puede caminar, which means... Nada, cara, man, man. Hola, Miranda, ¿cómo estás? Hola, Taco Bell. 
or posts the story of Thanksgiving in an extremely inaccurate way. I'm such a lost pilgrim. I'm Christopher Columbus. I have found this land of America. Thank you for rescuing me, Columbus. Wearing a feathered headdress, speaking in gibberish again, and doing an inaccurate reenactment of the first Thanksgiving. This is my pet, Squanto. Hi, Chi Chi. You can't talk about. Oh, I'm hungry. Good news. I caught a turkey, so we're going to eat it together and call Thanksgiving. Where Miranda sings doing a parody of the Korean pop song Gangnam Style, where she, again, sings gibberish. <laughs> Aha, comedy equals casual racism by pretending to speak another language by speaking gibberish. So funny. Miranda Singh's character also posted a video titled How to Sing Like a Black Woman, which was supposed to be a tutorial about how to sing like a black woman. How to sing like a big black woman. Now, some of you might say that this is racist. Um, it isn't because he said it, not me. Well, if you want to sing like a big black talented woman, what you would do is sing it really loud with really lots of vibrato. Just shake your head and then a vibrato come out. So for example, and I am telling you, I'm not going. There's also, of course, the offensive video that Colleen Ballinger did with her sister. I am Rosa. This is my cousin. Mm -hmm. We work at the taco together. I crossed the border. I went to borders and then I read a book on how to make my look. Don't you know it's illegal for me to even talk about him? It's not illegal. You just can't be with him 50 feet. I know. There was also the My Family video that made fun of Asian stereotypes. Now, interestingly enough, this part of the video has been completely edited out on Colleen Ballinger's channel, but the original version has been reposted on YouTube. Colleen. <laughs> Colleen Ballinger. The weird part about this is her whole family was involved in this video. So it makes you wonder if certain racist beliefs have been shared within her family. Ex-coworker April Quarto Kio bored recently with her experiences working closely alongside Colleen Ballinger as a showrunner and writer's assistant on the set of the Netflix show Haters Back Off. April recalled an instance where Colleen used the N-word and wrote disturbing and innuendo storylines. April wrote about her experiences on her blog ApologizeToMe.com and April emphasized many instances of blatant racism as well as Ballinger's general cruelty to those around her. Upon meeting Colleen, my first impression of her was that she was boisterous, opinionated, and had a stunning lack of humility that was unlike anything I had ever seen, April wrote. April said that Colleen would brazenly comment on her hair, clothes, and personal life, and April called Colleen's lack of boundaries remarkable. Keo was the only person of color working with Colleen Ballinger on Haters Back Off. April claims that she was the only black person working in the office, but that she knew how to make nice working in a white space. I recall overhearing Colleen once brag that a creator was being canceled for saying the N-word and that she would never be stupid enough to get caught doing something like that. April said, Keo pointing out that Ballinger had used the slur itself. It was almost like she took a weird pleasure in making me uncomfortable. And knowing that even if I wanted to, there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. Ballinger put an emphasis on not having people of color cast or extras. April even recalled when the show was looking at doing a scene in an Asian food market. I took note as Colleen was shown an Asian food market that would be redressed as a bodega for the show and watched her disgust as she demanded assurance that all the Asian shit would be removed before filming. 
filming, and Colleen Ballinger seemed unbothered by the show's all-white cast. I sat patiently as the powers that be expressed concern that the entire main cast for the show was white and silently prayed that since someone with some actual say had spoken up, things might change. And I took note yet again as Colleen assured them that they had only casted the best person for each role and that it wasn't her fault that all those people ended up being white. According to April, Colleen Ballinger also insisted on writing in storylines and scenes between related characters on the show. And it's worth noting that Haters Back Off's target audience was minors. Keo said she was shocked by the show's predominantly younger audience and the hours she claims Ballinger spent trying to think of a way to show Miranda and Uncle Jim all but having on screen. She often pitched stories in which Miranda and Uncle Jim would be caught in compromising positions or stomach-churning moments of intimacy that could always be easily explained away by a clueless Miranda. In one instance, Keo had been asked to look for mock-ups of the daddy saddle, a prop that Ballinger used on the show to ride on her uncle's back. She also claims to have been forced to mark points in the script where Ballinger thought Uncle Jim could have been even more ready. The content viewed by a vulnerable child watching could make it nearly impossible to identify inappropriate adult behavior in their own lives. It's unfortunate that there was a power dynamic at play where April had no say on this production and had to sit back and watch Colleen Ballinger completely take advantage of this powerful position she was in to put all white people in these roles, bestuous storylines, into her show, have a lack of boundaries between staff members, and continue her pattern of inappropriate relationships even when working on sets. It's extremely unfortunate and I'm really sorry to hear that happen to April. An article came out that many are labeling a hit piece. The article is very strange because it doesn't touch much on the accusations and only mentions Adam McIntyre by name, almost painting him out to be enacting a targeted campaign against Colleen Ballinger, all for fame and attention, which is the classic method which people have attacked and tried to silence victims from speaking out all throughout history. They want attention. They're obsessed with the perpetrator. It goes on and on, the same old stories. And this article was posted surprisingly by Vanity Fair by Andrew Quintana titled How the Miranda Sings Colleen Ballinger Scandal Went Off the Rails. And in the opening statement, article states how the drama is tearing YouTube apart which I think most people disagree with that statement, as everyone's kind of been on the same page about the entire situation. And there's some just in general, very strange quotes in this Vanity Fair article. For example, this quote here that reads, various allegations remain unverified, left to endlessly circulate as they fall under that ever expanding umbrella of inappropriate behavior. Various allegations remain unverified? What has actually been unverified? That's my question. There's been provable text messages that Colleen Ballinger confirms herself when she says, many years ago, I used to message my fans. Many years ago, I used to message my fans. There's been video proof of her doing inappropriate acts on stage or doing creepy or racist things on camera. Literally, what is not verified? The only thing that I would say was unverified and defined as the vague statement of inappropriate behavior was Johnny Silvestri's statements about Joshua David Evans, where he provided very little evidence and just stated that Joshua had an inappropriate relationship with him, which we now may have a clearer picture as to why that was the case. But instead of Vanity Fair mentioning that aspect of the story, they only mention Adam by name and only paint Colleen as the victim. In a sense, this is a familiar story for the social media age. Is it? 
Is this a familiar story with the social media age? Because it shouldn't be. This should not be a familiar story with the social media age. Can we make it not a familiar story with the social media age? Because I would like it to not be a familiar story with the social media age. I would like that very much. I think we all would like that very much. But Ballinger's downfall is unique. It certainly is unique. She brought teens into an adult world. <laughs> she did bring teens into an adult world. She brought teens into an adult world and made it feel like it was theirs. Yeah. Saw those fans turn against her. Fans turned against Colleen once she disappointed them, which they have, I don't know, every right to do. This writer, I would say journalist, but according to Lit Hub, Andrew Quintana is actually just a writer. This writer, Andrew Quintana, is trying to make it out as if Colleen Ballinger, again, a victim of her own fans, who she gave the gift of bringing them into an adult world? So she gave them the gift of growing them, is what you're saying here. Again, the whole article is written in a very odd way. Assuming that these child fans are seeking payback from this former star that they looked up to, very odd. I can understand why people are sketched out from this article. Adam also did a video talking about the Vanity Fair article. Even though this Vanity Fair piece mentioned Adam McIntyre over and over again, they never reached out to Adam McIntyre for comment, which is very interesting for such a prestigious publication to not do that. If you're in a big publication and you're making statements against someone or for someone, you need to ask them for a comment and you need to allow them a chance to respond and if you do not do that it's unethical reporting which can then be looked into legally because it's biased reporting on a big platform and then it's whoever falls liable whether it's Vanity Fair or the journalist or the editors. The article also minimized what Colleen Ballinger did yet continually attacked Adam for speaking out too much, which is again the classic victim blaming, attacking the way a victim is supposed to speak and the manner in which they're supposed to do so. And the fact that they don't mention Trisha's name, I think is trying to get Trisha not to respond to it. And I believe that that was something, in my opinion, that Colleen's camp would push for, for Trisha not to be mentioned by name. So, with such a chaotic, tumultuous, disastrous aftermath of an apology, I'm sure you're wondering, is this all a joke? Has this all been a toxic gossip train? There's been so much commentary and coverage on such a sick, disturbing thing, and why? Well, in my opinion, the world needs to be aware about this because we have to be aware of these practices to stop these sort of things from happening in the future. We thought maybe a new generation wouldn't continue the same old patterns, but we were incredibly naive to think that. Because abusive people don't just exist within the same generation, culture, or demographic. Abusive people exist all over the world. Andy Warhol said, They always say time changes things, but you actually have to change them yourself. You can't just point out these systemic problems and then hope they get resolved in time. Or they will keep popping up again and again over time in new ways. Same problem, different font. You actually have to make the change, not just notice it. Colleen Ballinger represents every exploitative person from these past ways. They've used their power and power imbalances to take advantage of people. They've used a lack of checks and balances and a lack of regulations, a lack of transparency and a lack of accountability to exploit the most vulnerable. I'm sure there are many watching who have dealt with a Colleen Ballinger in their lifetime. That's all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching if you made it to the end. Comment if you like the new set upgrades. I'd love to know what you think. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it since we put so much effort into these videos. I hope you're all doing well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!